Starting off this countdown, we have the oil eating super bugs. Wouldn't it be great if there was a bug out there that could go around eating oil? That way they could easily clean up oil spills and help clean our planet. Well, that's exactly the idea that General Electric scientists had in the mid 1970s. They introduced a plasmid that allowed a bacteria to digest petroleum. But thankfully, people realized how dangerous this would be. This engineered bacteria could start consuming everything in its path and then outcompete other bacteria and organisms, and then destroy the balance on Earth. So I'm glad that they didn't follow through with this one. In our number nine spot today, we have cell regeneration. This experiment comes to us from 2009 from the University of Pittsburgh's McGowan's Institute of Regenerative Medicine. This experiment, which proved successful, was aimed to find a way to regenerate human cells, especially in the hopes of one day being able to regrow human limbs. Obviously an interesting topic with an important and exciting goal, but the way they went about this was definitely quite shocking. Basically, scientists took a pig's bladder and scraped out some cells from the inside of the lining. They then took these tissues and decellularized them, which is the process that is used in order to isolate the extracellular matrix. After this, they are dried and then used. By this method, scientists were able to actually regrow a finger which is pretty unbelievable. There is something kind of insane about a dried pig bladder being able to regrow an organ, but science is pretty wild a lot of the time. In our number eight spot today, we have vampire rats. Whether you believe in vampires or not, this experiment might have proven that they really might be onto something. It is possible that maybe the blood of the young can make you reverse an age and live forever. Well, maybe not literally. Scientists conducted an experiment in which they joined two mice together. One of the mice was young and one of the mice was older. They connected their circulatory systems in order to study the effects and basically just to see if anything would happen. Once the circulatory systems were connected and the older mouse was receiving the blood of the younger mouse, the older one began to experience reversing in the aging of both the muscles and the brain. This is obviously extremely interesting, exciting, and potentially promising, but there is much more research and time that needs to go into this particular study before it can even begin to think about reaching a human trial phase. In our number seven spot today, we have the Roborat. As it turns out, our phones sometimes are not enough to keep full tracking tabs on us, so it looks like people are trying to create even more creepy, sneaky ways to spy on, well, anyone. Researchers have found a way to have remote-controlled animals that can help them keep an eye on you. Cybernetic rats and beetles have both already been created and have proven to be quite effective, which is already quite disgusting and a little strange, but now researchers are wanting to take it even a step further. Next up is flying bugs. Imagine that fly buzzing around your bedroom and keeping you up at night is actually being controlled by someone who's trying to keep an eye on you. This one could definitely be the plot to a horror movie. Maybe it already is. In our number six spot today, we have the undead. If you've seen The Walking Dead or really any zombie anything, you'll wonder why anyone was ever conducting this experiment at all. And if you're a sensitive animal lover, you might want to skip over this number. A team of Russian scientists released a video in which they showed a few dog heads that were being kept alive by an artificial blood circulation system. In the video, the scientists used a heart lung machine and were able to show the dog's head responding to sound. They would wiggle their ears, blink their eyes, and sometimes were even able to lick their mouths. In 2005, for some reason, American scientists began to try to recreate this horrifying experience. They flushed out all of the blood from a dog and replaced it with oxygen and sugar saline. Just three hours after this and after a blood transfusion, and an electric shock, the dog was somehow brought back from the dead. I truly wish I knew the purpose of this experiment, but I think I mostly wish it just never occurred at all. In our number five spot today, we have Britches. Britches is a perfect example of a horrifying experiment done on an animal for human gain. Basically, researchers wanted to test out brain implanted sonar devices in an attempt to create something that would be an asset to people without sight. There have been people without sight in the past, and I'm sure also in the present, who have been able to develop a sort of echolocation type skill where by clicking their tongue or making other sounds, they're able to map out their surroundings. Such a cool thing and having a scientific advancement or the technology to help with this process should be an amazing thing and it definitely is until the experiment takes a very dark turn. This is where Britches comes in. Britches was a monkey who did have his sight, but in order to test the efficacy of this device, they needed a monkey without sight. Instead of finding a monkey without sight, they just took Britches away 
away, and they did this by sewing his perfectly healthy eyes shut. This experiment was undoubtedly helpful in the scientific process, but it should never be at this kind of a cost. It is pretty clear that Britches most definitely did not deserve that kind of treatment at all. In our number four spot today, we have the Hoffling Hospital Experiment. This experiment happened all the way back in 1966 in a time where the rules of psychological experiments were a lot more loosey-goosey. Because of this, the nurses that were all a part of this experiment had no idea that they were participants, which nowadays would be illegal. Basically, this experiment took place on the night shift. The night nurse would receive a phone call during the shift, and on the other end would be Dr. Smith, who's actually the researcher. He would ask the nurses to check the medicine cabinet to see if they had a drug called Astrotin. This was actually a drug that was made up for this experiment, and it was just a placebo. The Astrotin would clearly state that the maximum dosage was 10 milligrams, but Dr. Smith would ask the nurses to administer 20 milligrams. They were told that the doctor was in a hurry and he would sign the authorization papers as soon as he came to see the patient later on that night. If the nurse decided to give the patient the drug, they would be breaking three rules. They're not allowed to accept instructions over the phone, the dose was double the maximum limit stated on the box, and the medicine itself was unauthorized and it wasn't on the ward stock list, so it shouldn't be in use at the hospital. Out of the 22 unknowing nurse participants, 21 of them went to administer the this drug. That's insane. This wasn't to say that nurses were bad people or bad at their job, but this experiment combined with the interviews that happened afterwards showed how the power imbalance and the social pressure that comes along with that can affect the outcome of a workplace extremely drastically. And in this case, it really could have been a matter of life and death. In our number three spot today, we have THN1412. In 2007, there began the trial of a newer drug called THN1412. 1412 that was intended to be used to treat leukemia. It is normal for a drug to have gone through an animal testing phase prior to being tested on humans, and this one was no different. This drug had been only tested in animals prior to this, but the animal trials were very successful, so it was dubbed safe to begin testing in human trials. To start off with, the humans were given a dose that was 500 times lower than the dose that was given to the animals, just to play things as safe as possible. Unfortunately, however, these precautions did not seem to be enough as this drug that had undergone all the necessary pretrial steps ended up being catastrophic once humans became involved. This drug began to cause organ failure in those who had even a tiny dose of it. I'm not sure if there would have been a way to know this prior to this terrible event or if this is just one of those terrible caveats to the trial testing process. In our number two spot today we have the Tuskegee syphilis experiment. In the years between 1932 and 1972 there were 399 black impoverished farmers in Alabama who all had syphilis who were recruited to participate in a free program. They were told that the program would help them treat their ailment, but of course that never happened. The experiment was conducted by people who were trying to see what would happen if the disease went untreated. Instead of treating the men with penicillin, which was the recommended treatment at the time, the men received aspirin and mineral supplements as placebos. And while this experiment was conducted to try and understand what effect the spread of disease has on the body, the unethical considerations of the scientists who conducted it proved to be absolutely fatal and just downright cruel. Out of the 399, 28 of them passed away from the disease directly, 100 of them passed away from complications related to the disease, 40 spouses became infected, which then led to 19 children being passed the disease at birth. This whole situation truly is one of those times where you stop and wonder how these things were ever treated as acceptable and really hope that things have changed for good. In our number one spot today, we have Unit 731. The Imperial Japanese Army's Unit 713 conducted some pretty horrifying experiments during World War II that certainly are shocking to anyone who learns about them. The experiments were meant to be done as a way to prepare for biological warfare, but the process was gruesome and extremely inhumane. Different medical schools and universities provided doctors and other research staff to help conduct these experiments, and they used both prisoners and civilians as the guinea pigs for them. There were a bunch of different experiments experiments that were conducted during this time, some of which involved injecting them with pathogens such as plague or cholera or anthrax. Others involved vivisection or operations with no anesthesia, putting them in a pressure chamber to see how much a human can withstand before bursting, or live weapons testing. It is hard to believe that this was a real thing that happened and we honestly can't even begin to imagine what those people were forced to face during that time. Starting off at number 10 now, we have the Manhattan Project. Some of you guys may recognize the name
name of this one. It was the secret name for America's project to produce the atomic bombs that brought World War II to an end. Harry Daglian was a young physicist who worked on the project. During an experiment on August 21st, 1945, he was attempting to build a neutron reflector manually by stacking a set of 4.4 kilogram tungsten carbide bricks in an incremental fashion around a plutonium core. Unfortunately, he dropped a brick which set off a chain reaction. He tried to stop the reaction, but by the time it was over, he received a high dose of neutron radiation. Harry received intense medical care for severe radiation poisoning. His mother and sister even flew out to New Mexico to care for him, but Harry fell into a coma. He died 25 days after the accident. His death resulted in new safety regulations when handling radioactive material. In our ninth spot, we have Project Artichoke. This is one of the many unethical experiments conducted by the CIA. This one took place in the 1950s as the CIA wanted to see if they could take complete control of a person so that they could do their biddings for them against their own will. Project Artichoke used hypnosis, forced morphine addiction, withdrawal and the use of chemicals to try and cause amnesia in the test subjects. Thankfully, this project was shut down in the mid-1960s. Imagine if they did find a way to gain complete control over humans. Imagine what sick stuff they could make us do. They could turn us into cold-blooded killing machines. In our eighth spot, we have the radiation tests. Back in 1954, the US conducted a number of radiation tests on humans. They called this Project 4.1. It all started with Project Castle Bravo. This was a series of high yield thermonuclear weapon tests that took place on Bikini Atoll in the Marshall Islands. Little did they know that the yield of radiation was going to be much larger than they anticipated. This left a number of residents injured. So they created a secret study to, and I quote, evaluate the severity of radiation injury to those accidentally exposed. Now, some say that the exposure to the radiation was accidental, that they didn't really mean for it to happen. Others believe that this was part of their plan all along. And obviously, nuclear testings are bad for a number of reasons. The effects this experiment had on the exposed individuals were nasty. In our seventh spot, we have weaponizing the plague. In the late 1980s, the Soviet Union thought it was a good idea to use the plague as a weapon. Keep in mind, when the plague was around, it killed half of Europe's population. During the 13th and 14th centuries, the amount of people in the world dropped by 100 million people because of this. But they ignored all that and decided that it was a good idea to launch the plague at enemies in missile warheads. But it wasn't just the plague. They had hundreds of tons of anthrax and smallpox as well. How great is that? All we need is for countries to start a biological warfare. The population would be wiped out so fast. Coming in at number six, we have the infected mosquitoes. From 1956 to 1957, the United States Army conducted a number of biological warfare experiments on unexpecting residents of Savannah, Georgia and Avon Park, Florida. One of these experiments involved releasing millions of infected mosquitoes into the cities. They wanted to see if the mosquitoes could spread yellow fever and dengue fever. The mosquitoes were infected with these. Turns out that they could, and the results were shocking. Some experienced respiratory problems, others got encephalitis and typhoid. Some even gave birth to stillborn babies. As for the public, well, a number of individuals got sick from these mosquitoes and several people died as a result. Imagine if these tests were still up and running today and a country was able to weaponize mosquitoes and other insects. That would be very disastrous. We're now at our fifth and halfway mark with the human experimentation. Over the years, the Soviet Union has performed a number of unethical tests on humans, including testing a number of poisonous gases on them. So beginning in 1921, the Soviet Union created a number of poison laboratories. They called them Laboratory 1, Laboratory 12, and Camera. In these laboratories, the unthinkable would happen. They wanted to find a tasteless, odorless chemical that could kill someone, but not be detected in their autopsies. So they tested a number of poisons on people, including mustard gas, ricin, digitoxin, and curare. They were given these poisons in their food or drinks, or they would take it straight up thinking that it was medication. 
Hundreds of test subjects died as a result. And it's scary why the Soviets wanted to do these experiments in the first place. Basically, they wanted a way to kill people without people knowing it was them doing so. If a person dies from a poison and it's not detected post-mortem, then they could get away with it. So who knows how many people they killed outside of these experiments. And apparently the labs were reactivated in the late 1990s. So who knows what they're working on now. Moving on to number four, we have North Korea. North Korea is highly secretive, so it's hard to know exactly what they're working on over there. But apparently they are running a number of experiments on their prisoners. Rumor has it that each month, a black van known as The Crow goes around collecting 40 to 50 people. These people then get taken to an unknown location for experiments. Some prisoners are tortured, others are starved, others are suffocated to death with gas. It's said that in one experiment, 50 women died within 20 minutes after eating poisoned cabbage leaves. The purpose of these experiments are unknown, but we know that North Korea has something up their sleeve. Coming in at number three, we have Starfish Prime. Starfish Prime is the name of a series of tests that began in 1962. Basically, it involved the detonation of a nuclear weapon outside of Earth's magnetic field. That sounds like a terrible idea, am I right? But it wasn't just one nuclear weapon. They detonated six nuclear weapons. Luckily, our magnetic field didn't get destroyed. It just snapped back into place, as they said. But if it was permanently altered, that's bad. We would have lost protection from cosmic rays and solar winds. Not only that, but we would have experienced massive earthquakes as the continents moved around. In our second spot, we have SETI, or S-E-T-I, which stands for the Search of Extraterrestrial Intelligence. This is a program that has been trying to find alien life out in our solar system for more than five decades. But here's the thing. A number of people are worried about this program. They are sending out signals telling other life where we are, meaning if there is anything else out there, we are opening ourselves out for contact. And if they have sinister intentions, they could come and wipe out our entire planet. Like we're just assuming that aliens are friendly and won't want to take control of Earth. If advanced civilizations do exist in the galaxy, who says they don't have the power to come here and kill us all? Hey. Maybe they've been preparing for this for the past five decades, who knows? And in our number one spot today, we have Magnaporth Gria. This is a fungus that can leave nasty lesions on plants and cause huge damage to crops. In fact, it can release thousands of spores and contaminate acres of crops in a single night. Well, during the Cold War, the US did experiments using this fungus. They tried to weaponize it in a form of a spray or a bomb. Now, this was very dangerous. Because of how fast this fungus spreads, it could cause uncontrollable damage to the world's most important crops, leading to worldwide famine. Starting off in our number 10 spot, we have the Pit of Despair. This experiment was conducted by Henry Harlow and is one of the most controversial on this list. In a sort of mental health study, Henry decided to induce depression in monkeys. He took very young monkeys and separated them from their peers and mothers and put them into isolation in a cage that was called the Pit of Despair. Sometimes the monkeys would stay there for longer, more extended periods, and other times they would be repeatedly separated and put into the cage for multiple shorter stays. These monkeys all proved to be extremely psychologically disturbed after the conclusion of this experiment, which should have seemed kind of obvious even before the experiment was even conducted. These monkeys were used as a model of human clinical depression, but here's where things got even sadder than they already were. These monkeys were unable to be treated and rehabilitated. Despite various forms of treatment, they just were unable to get back to the place they would have been had they not been subject to this cruel experiment. Before I dive into this one, guys, please don't forget to hit that thumbs up button. It really helps us out. Next up on number nine, now we have the dioxin test. In 1965, dermatologist Dr. Albert Kligman conducted a study on behalf of the US Army and some pharmaceutical companies. They wanted to know how human skin reacts to harsh chemicals, a process known as hardening. Most of the information about these tests has since been destroyed or just covered up. We do know that he described his patients as acres of skin to experiment on. We also know he used dioxin on them, the active ingredient in Agent Orange. This happened around the time the US was covering Vietnam with Agent Orange in an attempt to push the fight against the Viet Cong in their favor. To speed up the experiments, Dr. 
Dr. Kligman injected his victims with a reported 468 times the recommended safe dose of dioxin. After that, not much more has been uncovered. It's thought there are still about 70 of the patients out there still. Their identities and current condition are known. Next to band number 8 now we have Operation Sea Spray. In September 1950, the US Navy spent 6 days spreading the bacterium Suratisha Marci Sens into the air about 2 miles off the coast of California. That bacterium lives in soil and water and is best known for its ability to produce a bright red pigment. This trait makes it useful in experiments because it's so bright it's very easy to see where it is. The project was called Operation Sea Spray. Its aim was to determine the susceptibility of a big city like San Francisco to a bioweapon attack by terrorists. In the following days the military took samples of 43 sites to track the bacteria spread. They found that it had infested the whole city and all the surrounding suburbs as well. During the test residents of San Francisco inhaled millions of bacterial spores. The military deemed the experiment a success. They got to see how far chemical warfare could spread and anyway they knew the bacterium wasn't harmful or so they thought. People started getting urinary tract infections and it was even linked to the death of a patient recovering from prostate surgery. This experiment wasn't even public knowledge until 1976, a full 26 years after the event. Moving on to number 7 now we have Project MK Ultra. This is a particularly famous one that you guys may have heard me talk about in a previous video. During the 1950s and 60s at the height of the Cold War, the US feared that communist countries were using mind control techniques to brainwash US prisoners of war in Korea. They wanted in on the action. So in response the CIA authorized Project MK Ultra in 1953. The secret operation was aimed at developing a defense against drugs or other manipulators that could control human behavior. Such was the secrecy of this project that even today not much is known about it. But we do know this. The project involved more than 150 human experiments involving psychedelic drugs, paralytics and electroshock therapy. Sometimes the test subjects were aware they were participating in a study but shockingly many did not. Even when the hallucinogenic effects started kicking in. Can you even imagine imagine how scary that would be. Many of the tests took place at universities, hospitals or prisons in the US and Canada between 1953 and 1964. The CIA didn't keep many records though and any good ones were destroyed when the program came to an official end in 1973. Moving on to number 6 now we have North Korea. Some of the things we've all heard about North Korea may not be true but some of them may be even worse than we could ever imagine. In 2014 a former North Korean officer stepped forward to say that the nation's military were using mentally and physically disabled children as test subjects in chemical experiments. He said this was the last straw that caused him to defect and leave the country. The man was called Im Cheon Young and he said he was taken to special training at the military academy. It was there where they taught him how to confuse the enemy without revealing your own forces, how to carry out assassinations and how to use chemical weapons. He was close to defecting on this alone and then came the field learning. This involved testing biological and chemical weapons on so called object. At first these objects were mice but soon they were using humans. Im said that he saw with his very own eyes disabled people, sometimes children, being killed by these chemical weapons just to show the soldiers how they worked. One expert said this is not surprising. Anyone who visits the capital will never see disabled people because they are allegedly taken away as children and incarcerated in special camps. Perhaps these evil experiments are what the camps are all leading up to. Moving on to number 5 now we have Project QKHILLTOP. This was a CIA project developed to study Chinese brainwashing techniques which they used to develop new methods of interrogation. The research was led by a man named Dr. Harold Wolf. Now, he was a researcher at Cornell University's medical school. Dr. Wolf requested the CIA provide him with information on imprisonment, deprivation, humiliation, torture, brainwashing, hypnosis and more. Based on this the team began to formulate a plan. They wanted to develop secret drugs and various brain damaging procedures. According to a letter that he wrote in order to fully test the effects of this Wolf wanted the CIA to make available suitable subjects once they had provided these poor souls to test on. Wolf also detailed the next step his research team would take. They would then assemble, collate, analyze and assimilate the information and will then undertake experimental investigations designed to develop new techniques of offensive, defensive intelligence using a potentially useful secret drug. Basically the whole thing is just the stuff of nightmares. I have no idea how this got through. Nothing more is really known about the test subjects or victims as they are often referred to now. Moving up to number 4 now we have Dr. Loretta Bender. This doctor has gone down in history for her experiments on children. She was a child psychiatrist who specialized
rise in children believed to have schizophrenia. For almost three decades, from 1942 to 1969, she was a highly respected expert in her field. Her preferred choice of treatment was electroshock therapy. These days, the practice has been banned in most of the world as it's seen as ineffective, cruel, and borderline torture in some cases. Still, this was a different time, and that's what Dr. Bender did to the children. Her methods involved interviewing and analyzing a sensitive child in front of a large group of people. She would then apply a gentle amount of pressure to the child's head. The theory was any child who moved with the pressure was showing early signs of schizophrenia. These days, that's referred to as total pseudoscience, but it took a while to figure that out. By the time her treatments were shut down, Bender had used electroshock therapy on over 100 children, the youngest of whom was just aged three. Reports described her as uncaring and the study as unethical. The shocks can cause memory loss, nausea, headaches, jaw pain, or even serious heart trouble, even in kids. Some say all of this was a result of Bender's misunderstood childhood that she had, and she was the product of her own environment and family. Now that is proper psychology, I'm just saying. Moving on to number three now, we have the Burke and Hare murders. William Burke is a guy who has probably tainted my surname forever. Along with William Hare, these two men from Northern Ireland were famous grave robbers in Scotland. One day, an old man they knew died, and to cover his outstanding debt to them, they decided to sell his body for medical science. Edinburgh University gave them seven pounds and ten shillings, a handsome sum in those days. With that, they were hooked. When another associate they knew fell ill, they couldn't even wait to see if he he would die, and so they suffocated him in his bed. Again, they sold his body to the university for money. The killing spree began. The pair murdered and sold bodies almost as their full-time jobs. They killed an old grandmother with an overdose of painkillers. Hare even killed his own blind grandson by breaking his back across his knee. Eventually, though, their whole operation was discovered when they got too sloppy. William Burke was hanged in front of a cheering crowd of over 25,000 people. Fittingly, after being put on public display, his body was donated to medical science. Next up at number two, now we have J. Marion Sims. This doctor was once praised as the father of modern gynecology. Now his reputation has been tarnished forever. It was found that he practiced these surgical techniques that made him famous on enslaved women. They included Lucy, Anarcha, and Betsy. The rest of them are unknown. He performed 30 surgeries on Anarcha alone, all without anesthesia. His legacy has long been questioned for the disturbing ethical questions that it raises, especially by those who believe that he used black women as medical guinea pigs without their consent. The Black Youth Project 100, a group of activists aged between 18 and 35, staged protests at a statue of Sims in New York. They wore hospital gowns splashed with red paint dripping down their legs. In a Facebook post, they explained that Sims had purchased black women slaves and used them as guinea pigs for his untested surgical experiments. He repeatedly performed gentle surgery on black women without anesthesia because, according to him, black women don't feel pain. Despite his very inhumane tests on black women, Simmons was named the father of modern gynecology, and his statue currently stands right outside the New York Academy of Medicine. And finally, number one now, we have the pregnant women. In January 2018, it emerged that after the Second World War, the US military gave nearly 1,000 pregnant women radioactive iron by their doctors without their knowledge. This was all part of a series of experiments to test the effects. Between 1945 and 1947, researchers at Vanderbilt University conducted this sick experiment that was funded by the US Public Health Service. All of the women were poor and had no knowledge of the experiment whatsoever. Afterwards, they were not even informed that they had been part of the study either. The radioactive iron was given as part of a medical cocktail by health officials that they trusted. Their aim was to record the absorption of iron during pregnancy. However, in the years since then, investigators have said this too was a lie, and that the real reason was for the military to learn more about radiation exposure. In the 1990s, Vanderbilt University finally acknowledged and investigated the experiments. The story broke when two women and one of their daughters filed a lawsuit against the university for exposing them to radiation. One of the women was Emma Kraft. She said at a Senate hearing that the experiments caused the death of her 11-year-old daughter due to cancer. The true effects of this study are still being investigated today. Mm -hmm. 